Hey there, welcome to this Eden Stays at Home talk. I'm with um, uh, uh, Tazin Khan, an Eden member, first and foremost, and I would call you a next generation cybersecurity specialist from the US. Uh, also with us, Ralf Bentrath, Eden member, uh, side job advisor in the European Parliament for the Greens and the EFA group on data protection, internal security, police and judicial cooperation since November 2018. And before I give you more time uh, to introduce yourselves, uh, let me just, for those who don't know yet, uh, briefly outline the concept of Eden Stays at Home Talks. So how this whole came, uh, thing came about was basically that, um, as both of you know, we have uh, Eden conferences every year. So uh, Eden standing for the Europol Data Protection Experts uh, Network. And usually we gather at uh, Europol headquarters in The Hague as we planned for this October as well. So we wanted to have nice panel sessions. And then afterwards, uh, maybe my favorite part would have been to go to Schwebening Beach, which is only half a kilometer away from Europol headquarters and uh, yeah, get together with the whole community and then COVID-19 <laughs> came in between. And we really broke our, I mean, we had to cancel the physical gathering, uh, of course. Um, now we're gonna go for a nice online event, but I'm gonna tell you more about it uh, later. But we also had this idea of Eden Stays at Home Talks. So I even made a little, uh, how should I say, script uh, outlining the concept. And on that script, it says, uh, no more than three or four participants, no longer than 15 minutes, a casual setting. I also had this idea that I'm gonna ask participants like what are you guys doing during COVID-19 times now that we are all in lockdown. Um, luckily, this is not the case anymore. Another brilliant idea I had was that uh, we all promote uh, things we do in order to keep uh, local business alive. So I brought this beer here from my favorite uh, uh, local brewery in The Hague. Um, I also plan crazy stuff like maybe if you play music that we uh, get together and do some of this stuff whatsoever. But what happened then was that uh, the first Eden Stays at Home talk came out by my colleagues um, Matthias and Apolline and that was so professional and so they, they put the bar so high that all the nonsense I had in mind with you guys is now off the table. So the very serious uh, topic uh, for tonight is uh, data protection in the, U uh, in the US versus the EU. Um, and, and I'm so happy that both of you are here because uh, uh, we have a US perspective and we have the EU perspective. But um, Tazin, maybe on, on you to introduce yourself in a little more depth than I did. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so honored to be here. So thank you. Um, I, as you said, am a cybersecurity specialist. I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. Um, but started realizing into my career how much of a passion I have for privacy, or at least the lack of privacy that exists in the U.S. today. Um, and I started doing advocation for privacy, in particular started an organization called the Cyber Collective that is rooted in bringing security and privacy awareness to consumers, to everyday people, to creatives, to thinkers, to, you know, people that probably are not as familiar um, about data privacy and data protection rules because everybody needs to understand it, right? So the organization is rooted in doing that. Um, we host community events. Our website is under construction right now, but we are rolling out some new programs that we're very, very excited about. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm honored to be here. I uh, know Rife's uh, background and, and resume and the rumor about GDPR being <laughs> built on <laughs> his computer. So I'm, I'm just so thankful. So thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, we are very honored. It's, it's great to have you here. Rife, over to you. You're, you're muted, I think. You're so professional. Of course, yeah. you're muted. 
Yeah, it seems the GDPR thing will follow me for the rest of my life. Uh, indeed, I, I used to work for the rapporteur in the European Parliament on the GDPR, which is the main chief negotiator on the Parliament side. And uh, indeed, uh, the GDPR was not drafted on my laptop. That's up to the Commission to draft legislation here. But uh, on my laptop, um, I went through over 3,000 amendments to still them into compromise texts. And uh, also the final legislative text that was uh, negotiated uh, together with the, the Council Presidency and the Commission in 2015 was also recorded on my laptop. You still see it on my uh, Twitter background picture. It's a picture of my laptop in the negotiation room with the text of the GDPR open. That's on the last day of the negotiation. Yeah, before that, I, I um, used to be a political scientist uh, working at several universities in Berlin, Bremen, uh, Netherlands, also near the Hague, Jan, in Delft, and also in the US for a couple of months on uh, cybersecurity and then data protection. So, um, as a political scientist, I looked into the history of data protection in one project and, and tried to figure out how has regu have regulatory approaches changed over the last 30, 40 years since we had data protection. Uh, with Europeanization, digitization, globalization, what have you. And then suddenly, a few years later, I found myself in the interesting position to um, draft and negotiate the next chapter, which was also we, Jan and I felt, felt a burden, a historical burden on our shoulders, so to speak. I still remember this time, I think there was even a movie, uh, a documentary about all of that, huh? Yes. Yes, it's called Democracy, and that was a guy from Berlin, David Bernet, uh, who did a long-term documentary. And his film team was the first one ever that was allowed to film in our closed-door negotiation meetings in the European Parliament, that we agreed yeah. on the Parliament's position. And so he went through all the ups and downs with us and, and uh, filmed a lot of background and discussions we had with lobbyists and interest groups and so on. And, and also was present when we had the final agreement on the parliament's position and then the final vote and everything. It's really super well it's, done. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a super nice documentary. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm your moderator today, of course. My name is Jan Ellermann. I'm a senior specialist in Europol's data protection function, Europol being the European Police uh, Office. So, but um, uh, back to our topic of today, data protection in the EU versus the US. I did weeks of preparation for this talk, of course. I did a lot of reading. Uh, so, uh, for instance, I, uh, I enjoyed very much a book called Targeted by Brittany Kaiser. So, Brittany being uh, the lady uh, from the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack. I enjoyed that, watch, uh, that one very much about Cambridge Analytica. And I also uh, had Clear Bright Future, which I can recommend from Paul Mason, which puts all of that into a philosophical context. And then I felt like ready for at least exchanging views with you. Um, a friend of mine still um, recommended Mindfuck by Chris uh, Wiley, which is another character in this whole Cambridge Analytica thing. So question to both of you is like, um, uh, what's your take on, on what happened uh, back those days? Can it happen again? Will it happen in Europe? And uh, maybe Tarzan, uh, ladies first, like what's your take on it? It's still happening, mm. <laughs> uh, is my first and foremost take as far as it relates to what's going on in the US at least, right? I'm we have to learn about GDPR at work. I'm not, like I said earlier, I don't like to call myself an expert in anything. I'm curious minded. Um, and so in the US, I don't think that um, right now the proper uh, legislation and um, protection laws exist. There are states that are that have uh, privacy laws in committee right now, but even then, right? Um, if you really want to go deep into my thoughts about all of this <laughs> and my existential ideas around what I think the, the government is doing um, as it relates to privacy laws, but how they're still maximizing on big data, right? And leveraging it to their advantage as it relates to campaigning and um, propaganda is just a classic tactic. It's something that has been leveraged from the beginning of time, right? And now it is done, um, it's automated and it is powerful and it reaches um, on a psychological level that I don't think 
we were able to reach before through just yeah. photos and um, billboards and whatnot, right? And so to what I, I try to do in my work is have people understand how much power their posts or what they're sharing has and how it relates to this larger dialogue and communication. Um, because I think no matter what, the whoever needs it will leverage it to their advantage, right? As it relates to a digital manipulation. Um, and if consumers are not aware that it's happening and consumers don't know what's going on, um, we're not going to be able to properly protect ourselves or hold our government accountable, um, which we're kind of, uh, the US is part of my language, a, a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment <laughs> with everything going on so you said you said that uh, i said it yeah okay. listen <laughs> no no um uh, look you said something uh, very interesting in the beginning because you said we don't have the legal framework and then uh, that makes me think okay but we do with uh, gpr in the eu but nevertheless like uh, the very same company cambridge analytica could also influence the the uh, brexit uh, uh, outcome heavily so how is that possible Ralf? Like, we, we have this brilliant regime, we have this level playing field, but still, it's not perfect, is it? Well, of course, no law will ever be perfect. It's all always a compromise, a political compromise. Otherwise, you don't get anything done. Um, but I think that the GDPR, and I'm, I'm really not modest about this one achievement in my life. <laughs> I think it's still a pretty good law. It was a big improvement also related to the previous directive from 95, because it's actually, as you said, uh, providing a level playing field. It has provisions for much stricter enforcement. It introduces the, the uh, country, uh, the market location principle for companies from third countries who want to offer their services in the EU. But um, the problem now, and that's what we've been witnessing for more than two years since the GDPR became applicable in May 2018, is enforcement. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of enforcement actions by the data protection authorities, who, by the way, in, in several member states, including Germany, are critically understaffed. Um, a lot of enforcement actions against smaller companies, against mid-sized companies. There were some really big uh, fines already issued, uh, for example, against a big uh, housing company in Berlin and so on, a couple of million. Um, what is the problem we found, find out now is the loophole in Ireland. Because most of the big, especially American tech companies, have their European headquarters in Dublin. So the Irish Data Protection Commissioner is the competent supervisory authority for them. And even if you file a complaint, as you now can, in your home country, like Max Schrems did in Vienna, like friends of mine did in Germany and so on, uh, if it's a complaint against Facebook, it goes to Dublin and then the Irish Data Protection Commissioner has to draft a decision and then coordinate with the other involved authorities to, to come to a final like European agreement on what, how how to deal with Facebook, basically. And I think we, we built a pretty good mechanism for how to do that, to make sure that the already pre-existing loophole in Ireland is closed. Um, in the end, the European Data Protection Board, which is the, the body of all the 27 regulators from the member states, can take binding decisions by a simple majority. So can, can overturn a decision from, from the Irish, so to speak. What we didn't have uh, on our radar back then in 2015 when we negotiated it is that as soon as possible in Irish can mean later than two years from now. And that's the problem. The Irish still haven't provided any draft decision to the other authorities so they could react and trigger the consistency mechanism. That's really a problem. We will have the um, Actually, tomorrow in the uh, Civil Liberties Committee in the European Parliament, we will have Max Stems, um, the chair of the European Data Protection Board, and uh, Justice Commissioner Julia Reinders to discuss the recent uh, Court of Justice decision on the privacy shield, Stems 2 for the mm -hmm. insider. Mm -hmm. And we will um, ask the commissioner and also Stems if they think um, the commission should finally start infringement procedures against Ireland. Okay. Or we, we maybe have to rewrite the GDPR at some point to, to put a fixed time limit in, into this special, uh, specific paragraph. That's really a problem. But I mean, how could we 
assume that as soon as possible would mean so long in <laughs> Irish, you know. <laughs> Okay, but uh, two, two thoughts come to my mind on that one. First of all, if you see Marx, remind him of uh, my invitation to also join our Eden event in October because he didn't get back to me. Um, uh, but more seriously, the, like the, the Irish uh, thing is, is one aspect. But if you take the COVID-19 crisis, uh, for instance, um, if you look into the, the guidance of the data protection authorities, I find quite a bandwidth of, of takes on what that means, what the GDPR means in practical terms. So, for instance, questions like, uh, can you measure the temperature of employees at the entrance uh, uh, because they might be sick? No, you cannot. Of course you can. It's, it's all, you have all the opinions by the uh, data protection authorities across the EU. And they all operate on the on the GDPR. Uh, another example, which is which makes that very obvious to my mind, is uh, what about a Corona app? So what we see can that be uh, hosted on a central server? Yes, of course it can. No, of course it cannot. It's the same legal framework which is underlying uh, registration of personal details in restaurants. So you go to one member state. Of course you have to register that. In Germany, for instance. In the Netherlands, now it was introduced, I'm sure there are other EU member states where none of that is the case. Uh, Sweden, most likely, uh, would be an example. So that is something where the Irish thing, for me, is, is an issue, uh, I understand. But uh, uh, in particular, in these days where we have this global problem, I would have expected the EU to stand in more unity. And then... And, and that is just another aspect, maybe comparing before we compare uh, what happens in the EU versus US then. You are right, but on the other hand, you also have to see the larger picture with the COVID-19 crisis. It, it uh, was the case that um, not, in the, not just in the area of data protection, which I think in, in this crisis is a minor problem, but also in the question of uh, closing national borders in, in, mm. in the EU and all, all kinds of other reactions, who is buying face masks and medicine and what have you. Um, EU member states uh, at the beginning of the crisis operated, uh, operated very, very uncoordinated. Mm. Each member state for themselves and Germany with the federal system even worse. Um, but then the Commission tried to get some more coordination uh, going on in terms of when can they close their internal borders and what do we do with medicine, maybe should we buy them together, <laughs> distribute them evenly, across all that. And then, as you said, the European Data Protection Board has issued guidelines on COVID-19 tracing apps and then mm. other data processing in the context of this crisis. <coughs> I agree there's sometimes different guidelines from different data protection authorities on, let's say, the, the lists you have in restaurants. But this is also a completely new situation. Yeah. For most of the other data processing going on out there, we already have years of experience and case law and agreements, and then things converge on, on one uh, understanding what is allowed and what not. And I'm sure this will also develop over time with, with uh, COVID-19 related data processing. Mm. So to Tazin, maybe one question here. Does um, I, I really don't know. Like, um, how's the debate on this in the U.S. Corona, Corona apps, and all of that? Does privacy still play any role in that debate, or are you already at point at a point where there, are, if I may say so, much more important issues? Um, they rolled it out onto phones, right, with the contact tracing applications, and there was definitely outcry and. A lot of what happens in the U.S. is sometimes led by the push of the people. The people mm. push for a certain change to be enacted, and then the U.S. will sometimes move in suit, right? Um, especially with the COVID-19 and contact tracing and with CCPA that was released. The biggest gap that I see with any of these large pushes that are being rolled from the top down or from the top going into the people is the lack of communication and the understanding of the people that are actually being affected. So in the US, there was a really large problem with CCPA. The laws exist. They're looking to create task committees, but the public doesn't know what any of these laws mean. <laughs> so it's like, great, you're implementing CCPA. 
what the hell is CCPA and why does it matter to me? And then on top of that, businesses are affected. So CCPA is pushed out. Now all of a sudden consumers can click a button and request their reparations for their data without submitting any evidence around it, which is crazy, right? It went from one extreme of mm -hmm. you don't have any protection to, hey, you have protection and now you can receive funding back without giving any evidence that your data was actually misused or mishandled. So then this puts a huge um, damper on businesses, especially medium to small size businesses. You, I had an example, I went to California right before COVID happened and I was going to a Pilates class. <laughs> and so I walk into the class and the woman, she said, I need to take a picture. And I politely declined and I said, no, thank you. And she said, in order for you to take the class, you have to take a picture. She didn't know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. so, one, I hate being told what to do. <laughs> Two, um, if I politely decline you to take a picture of me, the, that concept wasn't actually resonating with her. And when I don't have my glasses on and my big girl uh, suit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I look like a 12 year old. And so she already <laughs> was speaking to me in a manner that no, you, our business has a policy. In order to take the class, you have to take a photo. And so long story short, I explained to her what CCPA was. And I mm. explained to her that you can actually get sued <laughs> for denying the consumer's right to privacy and not having my photo taken, right? Um, and they understood finally, and I sent them some information in an email afterward to help them. But just with that small example, I, as I am a privacy advocate, and that's why I know my privacy rights, but my mother wouldn't know, my mm. sister, my immediate family members, and I do, they still don't know what I do for a living, right? Mm. They don't understand. They're like, oh, she's, she does computer Come stuff, <laughs> you know, but um, that was a huge eye-opener for me that yes these laws exist and this is really positive there are task committees and task forces being put together to help but if the people don't understand what one the actual um the consequences of not having privacy implemented or privacy laws implemented and then two the rights they have to their data and to that privacy what's the point mm -hmm. right so then it goes back to that question about the government, right? Are the privacy laws in place just to, as a notion to uh, keep the government from being attacked for not having something in place? Is it really about the people? Because from my perspective, representing multiple marginalized communities, it's not about the people at all. Mm. It, it, it's about audits and um right now more ways to make money and to find businesses if they aren't adherent to it right i know there are a lot of different nuances and layers and levels to it of course and it's wonderful but if it's not reaching the people it's affecting i just don't understand why what the point is right as i was saying we shouldn't do privacy laws because they will also have some compliance follow-up that is necessary or what, what, what's the point in the end? I don't get it. No, that's not what I, um, the point is if we are implementing privacy laws, if we are going to be making changes state by state in the US, especially in the US, there's no, there aren't any federal laws in place at the moment. I mean, there are, it's, everything is happening very similarly, I guess, in the EU, if you look at the US as a larger enterprise and then each state running its own regulations. Um, but my point is, if those privacy laws are being pushed, but there's no education and awareness that's reaching the public for them to understand what is being affected, how their data is being manipulated, if that they cannot conceptualize that, how uh, are they going to benefit from the privacy laws? I, I, th I think the point or how I got the point is that legislative action alone uh, might not be enough. So it's also a lot about awareness uh, raising, isn't it? So uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, Pardon me if I didn't explain that correctly. If I may, I, I tend to disagree. Um, in, in the old 
days of, of the GDPR reform and, and related discussions, a lot of focus was on consent. Mm. You know, people should mm. always be able to give their consent or, or um, don't give their consent uh, to data processing and then that's it. But it has turned out that this is really overrated mm. because often people, as you said, don't understand what they consent to, what then happens afterwards and all that. Uh, even although we, since 95, in EU legislation, we have a provision that people should be informed about the logic underlying the processing which was already in 95, a provision like show me the algorithm, but normal people don't understand that. And the same applies to many, many other fields of, of industry and so on. If I buy a car, I want it to have very little emissions if it's not even, uh, not yet an electric car. I want it to be secure that the brakes work and everything is fine and checked. I don't want to be a car technician or mechanic to, to be able to check that and, and, uh, and look into each uh, car and see what I finally buy. I want rules to be in place and enforced so I can trust that everything is okay. Yeah, the same yeah, should yeah. also apply to data processing. That's why we, on, on top of this consent, which is of course a fundament of data processing uh, pro protection in Europe, it's also in primary law and the treaty and in the Char Char Charter of Fundamental Rights, but we also now in the GDPR have the principles of data minimization, of purpose limitation, of uh, data protection by de design and by default and all that to give some guidance already for the software engineers and everybody else how to think about, how to approach things when you start developing uh, an IT system. Data protection by design. So um, as this is supposed to be a Europol data protection experts network, I'm trying to force a link to law enforcement here. So first of all, I can tell you all the things we have discussed also play a role at Europol because for us, for instance, the question is the same when it comes to measuring temperature of employees who come in. And we also have to break our heads about that. But maybe a more obvious link to actual operational law enforcement uh, work takes us back to the beginning of our discussion, like Cambridge Analytica influencing of elections and so on and so forth. So concluding question or last question I would have for you here is, do you think that is a matter for law enforcement, should be a matter for law enforcement, or is it rather something only intelligence agencies can be uh, dealing with? Because I'm not aware of many legal proceedings, let's say, uh, tackling uh, that uh, across the board, of course. Well, if you would like to shoot, is it a law enforcement thing? You are muted, Ralf. Uh, what, what do you mean, is, is it a law enforcement thing? Do you mean that law enforcement should uh, uh, investigate and prosecute companies like Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. or do you think you should be able to use their tools, or what, what's the link? No, the, the, the question is basically this whole, if you take the example of Cambridge Analytica, everybody says, uh, I mean, Tarzan said at the beginning, like, this is going on again, but I'm not uh, very much aware of, let's say, law enforcement being conscious and on top of uh, uh, this kind of very subtle influ influence on the masses. It is something which is so deep in our culture that you, you know, you use your Facebook, you do your thumbs up on, on whatever you're interested in, and then hence you become a victim of uh, targeted advertising in the best case. And, uh, yeah. But, I mean, but it feels so wrong that my question is where where do you draw or can we draw a line to say as of here it's criminal behavior it's not just uh, be, because the Cambridge Analytica pe people probably would have told you things like why we uh, also in the old days uh, elections were influenced you had all these posters you had all these ads in on TV so what's the difference so yes yeah I mean in technical terms in the context of the GDPR uh, the first uh, um, defenders, uh, so to speak, the first line of defense are the data protection authorities. They are independent, they are not no police of, uh, authorities, um, but they have certain powers that they can even go to a company and do an on-spot inspection without uh, having to, to tell them beforehand and, and really look at their servers and so on. They have these powers. And then, of course, uh, as in, in every administrative law proce procedures, uh, if the company refuses to let them into the building or help them in the inspection, then they can call in law enforcement okay. to, to yeah. enforce that physically, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's always the case. 
Um, but then also we have in the GDPR the possibility, of course, for member states to put additional sanctions uh, into their criminal code. That's not regulated by the GDPR, that's the competence of member states. We only have very limited uh, harmonization in, in criminal material law in the EU. Um, so that's still on top of that a possibility. And I'm not exactly sure, um, but I think certain, um, oh, this meeting has been upgraded. I found with unlimited minutes, okay. <laughs> um, that is, an, that is an indication we are being surveilled here because they yeah, saw yeah. this is such a great talk, so <laughs> we go before the 40 minutes and it completely screws my concept of short yeah. talks. So in any case, um, I just want to say in several member states, we already have criminal law provisions that uh, also relate at least to data protection uh, breaches. Um, maybe we need more, I don't know. Um, I think in, in cases like Cambridge Analytica and others, there would probably also be other criminal aspects that are not strictly data protection law, but things like fraud and so on that, that also are part of the criminal code. And in the US, um, we don't have a uh, local and a kind of nuclear document to be able to go to as far as privacy laws or data protection laws are concerned. And there are a lot of contradicting contradicting laws in place around surveillance and what the government is allowed to do. I mean, you consider the Patriot Act, right? There is a Privacy Act that was built um, early in the, I, I can't remember the date and I don't want to say the wrong one, but just with the Patriot Act alone, um, the reach that the government has given itself as far as law enforcement um, to take action based off of what they hear believe or infer based off of what they're listening to. So I think for your question, there are two sides, right? At least in the US, because the law enforcement to actually implement into the enterprise world of, are you following these regulations that are set up um, in order to protect the data of people? And then on the other hand, there's law enforcement with the ability to leverage certain surveillance technology to then enforce certain laws onto the public, right? And that I was telling you earlier, some woman in Australia just got arrested because of a Facebook post. So where are the, and it, it's not just about data protection, but you can talk about ethics. You can bring it back to Kant and Aristotle and Plato and, and really connect everything together. Um, and that's what I try to do is really philosophy to size around these concepts and bring it to uh, the table because where do you draw the line? And as far as law enforcement in the US is concerned right now, um, there is a lot of dialogue <laughs> around differencing opi opinions of how the law enforcement has um, protected us or enforced certain laws and does it happen um, ethically? right, uh, yeah. across the board for different people. So I think that's a question that can almost take days to answer for the mm. US side <laughs> of I'm, the house. But um, I'm afraid the, the, the whole topic, maybe data protection in the US versus uh, the EU was uh, uh, more a thing for a PhD or something, but we, we, we didn't do that bad. And we can continue um, during our event on 15th of October, which I briefly mentioned before. So it's, it's going to be, Ralf uh, described it as a second life uh, uh, style uh, conference. So you're going to have your tiny little avatar. So of course, we, there's no physical meeting due to COVID. Uh, but we ask you to join us, all of you who are watching this, uh, to join us on that island, basically, with your small avatar. We're going to have interesting panel discussions uh, featuring Tazin, maybe Ralf as well. You are, you are in the mood to join again, as you did in earlier years, and, and many others. Uh, Brittany Kaiser as well, for instance, whom I referred to earlier. So um, mark your calendars, 15th of October. I hope to see many of you again, um, including an after uh, work a gathering at a virtual beach with virtual beers and, <laughs> and a lot of real life music, I hope. So thank you very much for making the time and, and the nice chat with you guys. And I wish you 
Ralf, a nice evening and for you a nice day. Thank you. See you soon. Thank All you the so best, much. guys. Thank I you so much. Time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.